Okay, welcome to the very last session of the day. And um, well, at the very last session of the day, we're going to go talk about something exciting, at least. Uh, we're going to go talk about how to build a really fast NFV stack. Because um, I think if you're a developer or even a person that wants to go and run network virtual functions, Typically, what you would expect is that you look at what is my service model, what is my workflow topology, and what do I want to go really achieve? What do you don't want to really engage with is how is the wiring underneath done? So how do I onboard my VNF, so my virtual network functions, virtual router, virtual switch, and whatever? How do I wire the overall thing up? Um, how do I build my network topologies underneath? How is this networked into a particular network forwarder? All of these things should be all a magic to you, right? So somebody should go and build that substrate for you. The question is, what are the components to go and build something viable, and who's going to go do that for you? Now, we've been trying to answer that question, and well, we've been trying to answer that question jointly. Because what Toby Ford nicely expressed uh, at a money summit just recently, he said, well, today almost everything is there. All the components are there, so we have the building blocks. What we haven't really done is piece together a solution out of these building blocks as a community, as an industry, in the open. And that's apparently what we're doing in OPNFE. So we have all these various components. So we have infrastructure for data network analytics in open source, project called Panda under the roof of the Linux Foundation. We have various orchestration stacks by now, OpenO, Mano, ESM, and the likes. We have VM management systems like OpenStack. We have network controllers like Open Daylight. We have, well, base operating systems for quite some time with Linux. But who's going to go build me a stack that does that overall integration? And apparently, that is what OPNFE, Open Platform for Network uh, Function Virtualization, does. So rather than have yet another open source project which creates a stack, we created a project that does systems integration as an open community effort. So we take all these various components that we've seen on the earlier slide, piece them together, test them, find gaps, close these gaps, and start over. And we're testing that in an international setup. So we have a bunch of labs, some of them in Asia, some of them in Europe, some of them in the US, some of them vendor proprietary, so we just schedule things on these, these networks or donated labs, some of them in the open, like the Linux Foundation Lab in Portland. And we do this in a continuous way. So we run deployments over deployments over deployments in order to iron out what does and what does not work as a full solution stack. That's the purpose of OPNFE. Now, if you're building an NFE stack, an NFE stack will only be as good as your foundation. And if you're doing things like network function virtualization, what do you worry about most if you're running network function virtualization? Well, you worry most about shifting packets. So the foundation is a kick-ass network forwarder, well, and infrastructure to go and orchestrate and calibrate and whatever that network forwarding infrastructure. So we need something that really up levels our infrastructure, our forwarding infrastructure underneath to really become relevant for the NFE market. Because what we've seen so far, if you deploy vanilla OpenStack, vanilla OpenStack uses a, a soft switch infrastructure called Open vSwitch. Open vSwitch is great for cloud deployments, but it's not really optimized for anything networking. It does something like 60,000 packets a second. That's awesome if you're mainly compute focused, but if you want to shift packets, that's not the case. So, you need to go and build a stack that really performs, performs at the level that you know from a network forwarding perspective. So let's add networking to NFE stacks, and that's what we've been basically doing since roughly the Colorado release in OPNFE, which is past September last year. When OPNFE started, they built the entire infrastructure, so a distributed infrastructure to test, deploy, and iterate. And then suddenly we started to bring the right componentry in to also do NFV at scale. So we need a kick-ass virtual forwarder, as I said, something that is feature-rich, high performance, highly scalable, and also highly adaptable, so that we can roll new features really rapidly. 
And in addition to that, we need to be able, it's NFE, but it's not an NFE in its entirety, because sometimes an NFE deployment will be, yeah, you have a load of virtual appliances, but you have a border router, and that border router is an ASR 9000. And all of that needs to be part of one solution stack, right? So you need to be able to have an infrastructure there that can talk to physical and virtual devices at the same time. So you need a network controller. You need something that allows you to define forwarding policy across an infrastructure that is not only virtual, but also physical, both at the same time. Which is why we combine two main elements into that solution. One is a piece that we call Vector Packet Processor. It's a piece of software that we started as an open source project roughly a year ago, March timeframe last year, under the FD.io, FIDO, FastData.io foundation under the Linux roof, uh, under the Linux foundation roof. Highly scalable, high performance, very extensible forwarder, and we're going to touch on that in a minute. And from a control perspective, we've been choosing Open Daylight as the state-of-the-art network controller so that we're able to configure physical devices, virtual devices in a single seamless infrastructure. All in open source, obviously. So what is VPP? VPP is, well, shifting packets at scale like crazy. So we can have forwarding performances seen as round about 14 million packets on a single core in an optimized environment on a single core. So that means if you have an infrastructure of uh, 24 cores, we've just pieced that together round about for the Cisco Live in Vegas half a year ago. So you can push half a terabit with 24 cores. So if it's basically a, well, a state-of-the-art computer that you can buy well, in a, a little bit of a more upmarket store uh, for a couple of thousand dollars, and it gives you a forwarding performance of what top-notch routers like a CRS 1000, uh, one, say six, seven, eight years ago, half-rack chassis used to do. Nowadays, you can do that almost entirely in software. Um, there is one key thing that differentiates VPP from what most of the other forwarders in the industry do. And that's, well, in the name already. It's vector packet processing. So rather than take in a single packet at a time and then take it through the pipeline, like layer two lookup, layer three lookup, processing and so forth, we suck in a vector of up to 256 packets at a time and take it through the pipeline. Why is this more efficient? Let me give you an example that I, well, personally experienced a while back when I went to a theme park. And we ordered lunch in a theme park in a cafeteria. And apparently, a friend of mine and me, we ordered the exact same dish. What happened is that the clerk that took the order looked at the order and for simplicity, uh, simplicity reasons, just like assume we ordered cabbage, potatoes, and some fish. He looked at the order, cabbage, potatoes, fish, took a plate, went into the kitchen, came back with cabbage, looked at the order again, oh, potatoes, into the kitchen, back. Oh, fish, into the kitchen and back. Handed me the plate. Next plate, looked at the order, oh, cabbage, into the kitchen, potatoes, into the kitchen, back fish into the kitchen. What is wrong with this if you look at that from an engineering perspective? What would have you done? Take the two plates, right? Exactly. So create a vector. Take the order of multiple people and then service the order in a single go as far as you can. Which means if you're, if you're taking things in from an e from a network perspective, the first thing is you're going to go do an L2 lookup. That means from a processing perspective, you're loading the instruction cache in x86 with, I need to go and process a particular piece of, packet, uh, of, uh, of the packet, the L2 header. So I load the instruction cache, and after that, I'm doing processing on that piece of the packet for a series of packets. So the effort to load the instruction cache is only there once for a set of packets, rather than I load the instruction cache, do some processing, and then I have to reload the instruction cache again. And loading the instruction cache is expensive. 
So just by moving from something that you do on a per packet basis to something that you do on a per vector basis, we share the cost of loading the instruction ca uh, cache across a sequence of packets all at the same time. And that's given us major benefits um, as we are kind of scaling out. And there is a bunch of additional things that you can do, obviously. You can kind of prefetch data also into the data cache prior to even operating on the things, uh, same thing. So there's lots of optimizations that we've done in parallel to that, but the main idea is just what I had in the cafeteria. Just simple engineering applied to forwarding. And it's kind of marvelous that most of the existing pipelines still operate in this one at a time. Okay, so what do you get with this? Um, well, once you do this, you take in the packet through a feature path in, or a, a feature tree, a particular uh, path in the feature tree. So it could be Ethernet input first and then an IPv6 lookup um, and so forth. It could be an IPv4 lookup. So the features in, v in VPP are individual modules that a packet kind of progresses through. This is beautiful from an infrastructure perspective because if you need something new, let's say we need PPP processing, something that we don't have, you can write it, you can plug it into the tree, and you suddenly extended the capability of EPP. Do I need to go change the Linux kernel to do that? No, absolutely not, because the whole thing runs in user space. So we are easily extendable. And we can also switch some of these modules for a hardware accelerated module. So if your hardware underneath say, has a security instruction set like AES. We can hand the thing off to hardware and get it back on while having software as a backup in case you don't have hardware support. So it's very flexible, very extensible, very different from many of the infrastructure that we've seen out there. Cisco's developing this thing internally for roughly 10 years. And in order to unlock the NFV industry, we decided to open source it around about a year ago. So it's mature code. It runs in an ASR 9000, for instance. It runs in carrier grade NAT. So there is a couple of places where this code is in production for years. Now, what do you get from that? So the main benefit you see around scaling things as you move up to, well, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of IP routes or MAC addresses. What you see with other infrastructure like Open vSwitch, even DPDK enhanced, is as soon as you scale the number of MAC addresses, performance drops. With the vectorized approach, you don't see that. We can shift packets with millions of routes, and we are not seeing any impact to performance. And um, you see that for IPv4, for instance, same thing. Um, it's invariant of what you're shifting, whereas most of the other infrastructures really don't scale that well. So in many cases, if you see comparison charts, yeah, it's a flow of two packets to a flow of two packets. I can be really optimal at that. But if you run internet routing, well, you're running with routing tables of 600 to 700,000 routes. I want to be optimal in that scenario as opposed to I want to shift a single packet flow. And there is another thing, and especially if you care about voice, you will care about that one. If you load a system, and that's back to the earlier discussion that we had, if you have a variety of packets coming in, and you load the system, then loading the instruction cache and loading the data cache all the time takes time. So if the system gets loaded, what happens? Delay starts to ramp up. That's what you see with classic infrastructure. And we've seen in an OVS term delays in heavily loaded systems up to 120 milliseconds. 120 milliseconds is already pretty disastrous for a voice application. Whereas with VPP, we've seen the variance go in, well, in average, something between 7, 10 microseconds to 23 microseconds, going up to 3.5 milliseconds. So that's kind of cool. And again, why is that the case? Because we share the burden not across a single packet, but maybe across 100, 200 packets at a time. Well, feature-wise, well, pick your feature. There is v4, v6 forwarding, MPLS, blah, blah, blah. It's all there. Um, the thing that isn't really there is it's a piece of kick-ass forwarding hardware, uh, or software, sorry. But how do you use it? It's like, I give you a kick-ass engine. Are you going to go put it into your car? 
maybe you, but nobody else will. So what you want to go buy is a car as opposed to a kick-ass engine. Yeah, some people are kind of really into switching the engine, but very few of us. So what we decided doing is, well, give people a car that has the engine integrated, at least show it how it can be integrated so that eventually, at least by looking at the car, you can figure it out for your own car or you take my car. Another thing that doesn't come with it naturally or originally is how do you configure this thing? It's a data plane. It's not a control plane. So somebody needs to go and program the routes. Who? Well, in the fast data project, we don't care. But we've built an infrastructure on top that writes to the native APIs that does processing so that you can northbound talk REST or NetConf to the box. These days, people want REST or NetConf as opposed to some native C-level APIs so that you can remote the API so that you can have a network controller like Open Daylight talk to it or NSO or anything else. So by now, we've built a piece of infrastructure that goes side by side with BPP in order to program the thing. And that piece of infrastructure, well, we didn't invent from scratch, but we stripped down Open Daylight to bare bones to just have the YANG capability, the RESTConf capability, and the fact that we can talk to Java stops. And we package that up in a relatively small footprint to have a programmable agent that talks to VPP. So we have the data plane. We have a little bit of control plane to go and program VPP, but we still don't have all the logic on top, right? So who gives me the logic of these routes need to be in the system, this is who, who can talk to who and, and the likes. One level up, well, open daylight and group-based policy. And, and you know the story very well because it's the same adaptation for open source that we have for quite some time with ACI. So ACI follows the logic of group-based policy. That means you group the endpoints into groups and then define contracts between these groups. So I have one tenant network, and that tenant network can talk to the outside world. So another client, and I say, well, you can only do HTTP, or you can only do HTTP and SSH. So I define contracts, bidirectional, unidirectional, whatever you want. And well, group-based policy allows you to do that, and then has rendering infrastructure to put that into VPP-specific config. So we define who can talk to who and then render that down into the system. Well, and one level up, who talks to Open Daylight? Well, if you're caring about VM scheduling, well, it's obviously OpenStack. And this is how the stack composes itself, right? So we are ready to integrate by now. We have OpenStack, we have Open Daylight as a controller. We have our hypervisor, obviously KVM here. And then we're adding VPP to the stack of potential choices that we've done. So you've seen all the right variety of selections. Obviously, there's not only a single network controller. We felt that Open Daylight gives us the biggest flexibility, which is why we did that. Um, there is also a bunch of install tools. There's not just one install tool for OpenStack, right? So if you follow the canonical flavor, it will be Juju. If you follow Red Hat, it will be Triple O or Apex. If you follow Mirantis, it will be Fuel. So there is a variety out there. So somebody needs to go and bring up the entire stack, configure it, get it to go, because again, you don't want to assemble the car yourself. We started off day one with using Red Hat's flavor, Triple O, mainly for kind of personal reasons, because I get along really well with the Red Hat guys. Um, there is interest in bringing the whole thing up in, in fuel right now. So there is a team in Ericsson that builds towards that. So you can expect more, more things in there. What do we do? We started building a variety of additional stacks with different capabilities. So initially, we said, well, maybe you only want to integrate OpenStack with VPP without any network controller. So very simple topologies only. Just plumb into a VLAN. So we've built a, an ML2 driver for, FIDO, uh, for VPP in FIDO. Certain people initially said, well, maybe we only want to use Open Daylight to set VXLAN tunnels up, but, well, rely on 
OpenStack L3, layer 3 forwarding. So the Linux kernel to go do the external routing. So just have fast forwarding initial, uh, internally within a tenant, but not across. So they saw that the change is too dramatic. Or we want to use L3 and L2 VPP4. All these scenarios are kind of defined, and we started to build them. Why did we build them out incrementally? This is really simple. Using open daylight just for layer two, a little harder. Using VPP for L2 and L3, so replacing Q router in, neutral, uh, in, in an open stack. Again, a little harder. So we incrementally grew into more and more functionality as we, we've been evolving the project. <coughs> so what we started off day one, and that was our initial target, and that's something that we released last September, was triple O Apex as an installer, OpenStack, Open Daylight at layer two, KVM, and VPP underneath. So that was the first solution stack. What we're building on right now is complete L3. So replacing the Q router, everything will be forwarded using VPP, and there will be no Linux kernel involved anymore. And in December, we also uh, introduced a stack that just direct integration between OpenStack and VPP. You lose flexible topologies and the capability to integrate physical and, and virtual devices. But yeah, well, if it's all you care about is a simple cloud stack that is fast, we have that as a capability. And uh, yeah, well, there is a kind of couple of companies helping us do that. So it's not a Cisco only piece, um, but we've been working with a bunch of people. Pulling that off was a major effort, which is why there were so many people involved. We had to do a bunch of additional work in open daylight. So group-based policy was there. So the ACI equivalent was there in open daylight. What wasn't there was the ability of group-based policy to talk southbound to the data plane agent that we talked about. We call that Honeycomb and VPP. So we had to go and build a new renderer to take the, the generic policy model, I can talk to you, you can't talk to me, and break that into VPP specific language. So that piece of code we had to go build from scratch. And then we had to do certain tweaks out of here even at VPP level to go give us all the functionality that we wanted for that stack. Typically, if you're building open stack setups, what is the tunnel technology that you that they typically use? Well, VXLAN. Did we have VXLAN available at that point in time? No. So we put VXLAN in. If you go and create a high-speed interface that allows a VM to go and talk to the forwarding infrastructure, there is a capability that people refer to as vhost user interface has been required. Again, we had to go and implement that so that you have user space to user space, fast communication bypassing the kernel. Again, we had to go and integrate that into VPP. So we've been doing enhancements across the board. And finally, we need to enhance the install tools and the test tools to test and install our stack. And that was something that we've done natively in OPNFV. So there was work in Open Daylight. There was work in FIDO. And there was work in OPNFV, and all orchestrated into one. The beauty of OPNFV is that we have these relationships already with the upstream communities. So we were able to pull that off. It's really systems integration as a community effort, as you see, which is why I'm insisting on that one so much. Because we are, we're doing what systems integrators do. You figure out you need something else, you do a little bit of extra work on that component, and then you piece it all together and test it. That's exactly what you do in systems integration. The difference now is we're not doing it for you or you or you. We're doing it for everybody in the industry as open and FESE open. Now, so how does that work? If you grow and create a single simple port, so you're attaching a VM to VPP, what you typically have is Neutron, so the networking module in OpenStack, will say, well, this is my user ID, this is my host ID that I've got to go and provision the thing on, and this is the particular interface that I want to go and create. And you receive an update port signal here. And that was goes from Neutron into an open, uh, open daylight model called Neutron Northbound. And Neutron Northbound does nothing but translate between OpenStack Neutron speak into 
the speak that I need at group-based policy level. So I'm taking the OpenStack abstraction into group-based policy abstraction. So something that is specific to OpenStack is becoming generic. Now that it's generic, I can translate that back into a specific forwarder infrastructure. Here, I'm translating that by the VPP renderer. I'm, I'm rendering GBP policy into specific speak that VPP understands. There is modules in GBP also that translate things into OVS or physical devices. But here, well, this is the piece of infrastructure that we had to build because the generic speak needs to be translated into VPP-specific commands as much as if you would go and translate it into specific commands for, say, a Cisco router or switch. The VPP renderer then configures the ports on the devices to go and attach the VMs. But wait. Not all the devices might be connected to the very same switch, right? So there might be multiple compute nodes out there that I'm running stuff on, very naturally. So I need to go and build tunnels between these nodes. Who does that? Well, I have a component that is a topology manager or virtual bridge domain manager, VBD, that helps me set up the tunnels between the individual nodes. So I'm attaching the ports. I'm creating the tunnels with the topology manager. And here goes my connectivity. So something that is generic here is translated into specific. And we, we start with specific, generic, specific to build up that, that domain. Now, as I introduced earlier on, so we've done multiple flavors of that stack, which is why I wanted to show you some examples with more or less complexity. The first thing that we took on is that, well, let's not overwhelm ourselves with complexity. So we're starting off with just using VPP for layer two. So just bridging between individual VMs and across VXLAN tunnels. And that's what we see here. We have VPP. In there, we configure bridge domains and the VXLAN tunnels. For reaching the outside world, we still go via QRouter, which is nothing but the Linux kernel, and then into the external bridge, which is an OVS, and to the external network. So we're just replacing the L2 component that you typically see. You see Honeycomb, so the data plane management agent for VPP running on every single node, and Open Daylight controlling these individual instances. If I go one step further, and that's what we're busy actively doing as we speak right now, we're replacing QRouter and putting all the functionality that resides in QRouter and enable this also in VPP. What does that mean? I need to do NAT on the thing. I need to do external routing on the thing. NAT is there by now. Routing is, was there from the very beginning. But we had to be able to go and configure NAT entries. That was something that we added in the last release, 1701. So we can now beef up this setup. And hopefully, for the next OPNFV release, late March, we're able to introduce that to the market. What we've done in, September, uh, in, in December time frame is another, it looks a little busy, the diagram, but it's almost the same that you had on the first diagram, where we're having bridge domains configured on the individual nodes. And we have OpenStack, Neutron, directly talking to VPP to the individual bridge domains. There is no topology management here. We just plug in into a flat VLAN which is why we can do it in a very simplistic way with an ML2 driver. Coordination across those, so that I have the same view of the world from what is provisioned where is using a, a, a key data store, which is etcd in our case here. But key observation is no topology management. We plug into a flat VLAN, simple, yet, well, possible. And we have OpenStack talk to a small agent, a Python agent, that directly configures VPP. So we replaced Open Daylight in a way, or we don't use Open Daylight to go and configure that. And it's a nice proof point that you can also work directly on the native APIs that um, VPP gives you, because VPP offers Java bindings, Python bindings, and C bindings that you can build your own stuff against. And that was an effort of, say, three people, three months. We had that going. 
So this is how it's pieced together. Let's take a look at how it works. So first thing that you need to go do if you want to go run it is install it. And that's just a little tour of what is possible or feasible with um, Apex or Triple O as an installer. Triple O, anybody heard of Triple O? Triple O is O, O, O. It's OpenStack on OpenStack. So it's a solution that uses OpenStack to install OpenStack. It's a project that is largely supported by Red Hat, but it's an open source project under the roof of OpenStack. And um, what we've done in OPNFE is we've just done certain tweaks to allow for network configuration and the likes, which are NFV specific on top of the standard triple O installer. If you want to look at that, it's all up in the wiki, the usual thing. So if you draw the slides, you can click on the links and find out more. Um, what it brings up is, well, a set of nodes. And there is one node that we refer to as the jump post. And that jump post runs something that is called the undercloud. The undercloud is a small instance of OpenStack that is just used to bring up OpenStack on the compute nodes. So that means this OpenStack is just there to bring up the overcloud, which is the real instance, your instance of OpenStack. So we have one control node and a bunch of compute nodes that we bring up. And on this, on the control node, we run not only OpenStack services, but also Open Daylight. We run our data plane management agent, so Honeycomb. And well, if we're running in the layer two scenario, we still obviously use the kernel. We have OBS there. And on the compute nodes, we have VPP, Honeycomb, Nova Compute, obviously. And well, we do this for the n number of compute nodes. From an install perspective, if you deploy Apex, you have your jump post that you're jumping, well, that you're using to install everything. So the, uh, the Apex installer usually runs as a KVM. So we bring it up the undercloud, so the OpenStack instance to install stuff as a VM there. And then we're using this to install controllers and compute nodes that, well, Triple O refers to as the overcloud, so the real instance of what we want to go run. And um, the thing that we've done in OPNFE is just a bunch of additional configuration settings. So there's three main files that you need to go modify that describe your setup. So what MAC addresses you have, what IP addresses you have, how many instances you want to run, but also system configuration, number of huge pages and the likes. And then we feed this into the main triple O installation infrastructure. So just to give you a flavor, installing OPNFE, that particular setup is really simple. It's a single command if you have your configuration files correct. Network settings the scenario file, and an inventory so like These are the systems that we have. You punch that in, and then it's typically for two hours. So if your thumbs hurt, that's what it is. But that is what a, a typical, well, bare metal deployment takes. It's an hour and a half, hour 45, sometimes two hours. Excuse me? The full stack, yes. So it brings up full open stack. It brings up the VM first. Then it boots up the nodes, um, installs the, uh, the base operating system. In that case, you're, we're running based on CentOS 7. Brings up the operating uh, system, then installs open stack, then installs open daylight, then wires the overall thing up, configures it, and ready to run, right? So that includes pixie booting the services and everything. So it takes a while. Even the initial boot up phase takes a while until you have every server pixie booting. And it, yeah, it's, it's laborious. Um, just to give you a flavor of what the, the conf uh, configuration files look like, the high level configuration file is quite simple. So Apex allows you to go and configure what controller you want to use, like Open Daylight here, what Open Daylight version you want to use. We're using Boron. Um, what data plane we're using, well, VPP means FIDO. And um, a key thing for VPP means setting the number of huge pages. Huge pages is quite important to set because um, if you would go with a default page size, not like one or two max here, 
but smaller, it takes forever because if VPP stay, starts up, it sucks in a bunch of memory. Now, if sucking up the bunch of memory means loads of little chunks, it's like picking up sand as opposed to picking up a big rock. So guess what is faster? Um, so that's why configuring the number of huge pages is, well, it's even recommended and required to, for VPP to perform that you have um, huge pages configured. Well, and if you wait and twiddle your thumbs for a while, this is what you typically see. Post install configuration complete. Um, as I said, it takes two hours to see that, but then you're happy. If you don't see that, you're not so happy. And then you've got to go look at the huge log at what went wrong. But then it just looks like any other OpenStack deployment. So that means from a user, user perspective, there is no change here. It looks like standard OpenStack. So what I can do is I can get an image, simple image. You can upload the image into Glance. You create your flavor for OPNFE. The key thing is that the flavor is going to be created with huge pages capabilities. That's key. Otherwise, it won't work. Then you create your neutral network. In this case, you create it with VXLAN. You assign a subnet to your network. If you want to communicate to the outside world, you also might create a neutron router. All standard stuff. Then we create our, our ports for the VMs. You can do that while immediately booting up the, the VM, so that's kind of an optional step. And then we boot our images with Nova Boot. So nothing specific. It's all like you interface with OpenStack. That's what I had at the very beginning, right? Below the line, if you're driving a car, how often do you actually open up the hood and look what the engine is like? If you're on the highway and it goes really slow, you might want to go do that, right? But typically, if you go fast, well, you just assume it's going fast. And uh, well, then you're done. And then you can look at the various things in your running system. So you can look at what router ports you have. So if you look at neutron port list, you'll see the various things. So you'll see the, the DHCP tap ports, so you get DHCP services. You'll see the different ports for VMs going to be connected. And you see the Q router port. I'm running in a L2 setup here. But you can also go and drill down and talk to Open Daylight. So I can run and talk to my Open Daylight and understand what is the, the network topology. So I can see and browse the models that I have loaded into Open Daylight. So I can see my VXLAN tunnels, for instance. I can see who's connected to who, that I have a particular um, Nova instance VM running here connected to my VXLAN tunnel 4. So I see a network-wide view. I can go and drill one level down. Again, Honeycomb, so the data plane management agent for VPP, has a REST interface. So again, I can go and query that one and understand what is the particular tap port that I'm connected to and the like. So I, I can go high level view, open stack. A little bit lower view, open daylight, network wide topology view. One level down, Honeycomb. This is what VPP does. And if you're really into it and don't like to access it remotely, you can jump on the box, do VPP control, show interface addresses, blah, blah, blah. So you can use the CLI to go and debug the thing. The fun thing is that through Honeycomb, through the data plan management agent, you in many cases see more information than what you see here. Because here you see bridge domains and interfaces, but here you can gather like information on how the overall thing is wired together. So usually, Kind of top down is easier than kind of what's really going on here. Uh, well, I, I don't really have the network view. Well, and then well, you're you're ready to run. Like you have your your two Nova instances up, um, and yeah, you can go to the console and look at whether the interfaces are configured and well, ping each other, right? So um, from a top level view. If you look at the thing from an OpenStack perspective, it's just OpenStack. We're hiding everything from you. Underneath, you suddenly have an engine, and the, the engine goes far faster than anything else. 
Um, roadmap, I already mentioned implicitly. So we came out in September with OpenStack, ODL just doing layer two and VPP. The L3 stuff is happening in Danube, which is March. So four months, uh, four weeks from now. And we've done the direct integration of OpenStack and VPP in December timeframe last year. Well, we've done a bunch of testing and we are basically right now just running the functional test suite over the whole thing that OPNFV runs for everything that they release. It's called FunkTest, functional testing. So it does simple things like, can I ping? Can I ping between the world and a VM? Can I ping between VMs? Really fascinating stuff, but useful, right? So it's, it's basic OpenStack health or smoke testing that we run there. We run that in that context as well. And well, we can look at the test results and if you're kind of okay in the green area that you could typically release and we managed to get that. That was a screenshot from a while back when we still had a couple of issues with Tempest. Um, so it's just a health check. If you go to testresults.opnfe.org, you'll get these, these health things. And even more so, we can deploy the things on worldwide lab infrastructure that OPNV hosts. What we've been doing from a development perspective is we use Cisco lab infrastructure and we use infrastructure from a nonprofit Canadian company called Sengen. And they gave us two labs, one based on Contron servers, one based on super microservers, so that we weren't only testing things on UCS, like UCSP and UCSC, but we learned a lot by bringing things up on other random hardware because, well, guess what? Not every single server is the same and you learn something new and it's like simple things like, oh yeah, well, we are configured with three interfaces. They are configured with four interfaces. Um, installer believes that there should only be three. So what do I do with a fourth? Confused, who? Fix, patch, needs to be doing something. So little things confuse you at times all the time. One thing that I want to go point you to is there is a little booth and that's called D8 and I think it's fast data blah 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 title. So it's right across and we're showcasing the stuff that I've been talking to, uh, to you about live. So we're running a setup in a lab in San Jose and we are performance testing the thing in a black box manner. So the setup is we have a deployment with two compute nodes, one controller, the jump post. So the stuff that I've been talking about is deployed. We're running the data plane management agent uh, VPP here, and we are having, well, very, very simple VNFs employed. It's a simple application that just short circuits the traffic that comes in, spitting it out again. And then we run a tool on another blade that's called what we call NFV Bench. It's a traffic generator that can push traffic at with different speeds, with different profiles, so 64 bytes, um, 15, 18 bytes, iMix, whatever, at different rates, adaptive, non-adaptive, and we are loading the system in a black box manner. So this whole thing just gets deployed, non-optimized, no nothing, because that's what you would typically do. You're not gonna deploy and then you're fine tuning everything. You're buying the car, you're driving, as opposed to you're buying the car and then you put out the screwdriver and, and start to fiddle around with the engine. And we're just pumping traffic into the system and getting it back and then we're measuring things. And we're doing it in a way that we're starting with very high bit rates and seeing that what is the level where we have zero loss or close to zero loss or what is the level where we have almost no loss, like 0.1%. So we're just tra pumping traffic into the system and trying to find these, these bars. And well, that's what we've been doing. And you can also kind of build up the system in a larger way. So pump traffic across not a single instance, but multiple instances. That's all part of what this black box testing NFV tool does. And guess what? We've been comparing what we've been doing to what you would do on a vanilla OVS setup. And obviously we're looking a little better. So what we have here is not non-drop rates, like where the drop rate is less than 0.01%. So OVS pushes around about 60,000 packets a second. 
That's what you can expect on a single core from OVS. What you can do with the setup that uses v, uh, VPP, so fast data stacks, is we're pushing here 2.5 million packets a second. So more than an order of magnitude of difference. And so the base level story is what I started off with. If you want to do NFV for real, you need forwarding infrastructure that pushes packets for real. So if you have 10 gig interfaces, you want to go and be able to fill the 10 gig interface with a single core. And still have a bunch of other cores to, well, do what you actually want to go do, compute, blah, right? Um, I think we unlocked the potential of NFV with this. Um, and it's also, well, not only this looks favorable, it also looks favorable if you compare things against OVS DPDK. Because as soon as you grow the number of flows, OVS DPDK doesn't look that great anymore. So go and see us. Um, you can look at the whole thing and you can look at the moving bars as opposed to a still picture that I have here. Um, and if you want to go learn more about that, I'm, I'm going to be around. Uri, my colleague who's hosting the booth or staffing the booth right now, is going to be there. We can take you to any level of detail. We can look at OpenStack, Open Daylight, uh, whatever underneath, and kind of open the hood and allow you to take the screwdriver a little and um, find out what's in it. So high-level story was really integrating OpenStack, Open Daylight with a really fast forwarder as a community effort. So not Cisco, not whoever, the industry. So we're trying to really move the industry along to something that allows us to run NFV for real in the open. Thank you so much. And if there is any questions, come and see me. Ah, there is one. I might not understand you, which is why I'm going to go move over you too. So how long does it take to make this a commercial deployment? Obviously, what we're doing here is kind of we're pushing the envelope a little. And what we're learning moves into Cisco product, right? So the stuff that we've been building is moving into Cisco product. What we're doing right now is we're integrating against OpenStack Newton. From a commercial perspective, well, you'd probably rather use Mitaka or even earlier versions of OpenStack. But that's moving into product. So if you buy the thing from Cisco, you can buy a Cisco NFVI solution. And the stuff is in there. But it's hardened, and you get a little bit more features, right? From an installer perspective, you get containerized OpenStack services that you can individually upgrade and downgrade. That's not part of the solution stack. So typical story, right? There is the stuff in open source. It's leading edge. And well, you can pick up the product that is then supported, yada, 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 but you're paying money for, right? So your choice. <laughs> but you can go and fiddle around with this and get your hands dirty. OK. Thanks again. Have a good day.